You have started screen share. Okay, class. This week's topic, mental illness, mental disorders, psychiatric diagnoses. I, when I look at my syllabi, my syllabus each semester, I often think this is the, the lecture, this is the topic that may be resonating the most with many of you who are watching this. And when I'm in the normal lecture hall, this is the one that I think might be the most relevant because as no surprise, student mental health is one of the paramount concerns among dean's offices and professors. It's one of the things that's always the third thought in our mind or, or how are our students doing in terms of their mental health. And it's one of the leading causes for why students need to take breaks from school and take medical withdrawals. And recognizing that and then looking at the data I'm going to show you in this lecture, um, mental disorders and illnesses and psychiatric diagnoses are huge, prevalent, major in their impact, one of the biggest causes of disability, the single biggest cause of disability, and hence they deserve a lot of attention. Unfortunately, because there's also a, an element of stigma attached to mental illness and mental distress, we don't often tell people that we are struggling mentally, although we will tell them we have a broken leg or we have a cancer diagnosis. The stigma associated with mental disorders and illnesses means that we often don't know the scope and the scale and the severity of mental distress. And this lecture is in part aimed at reducing the stigma and increasing the knowledge of the situation that we're dealing with when it comes to mental illness. Second slide, rarely do this in lectures. Try to keep this to a minimum. Students don't come to class to be preached at and hear my opinions. But this is one of the rare instances, I'll be very explicit, very clear, stated up front at the beginning of the lecture, put it on the second slide. It is my personal philosophical belief that we would be better off and it would be more appropriate if everybody, resources permitting, could have access to a therapist and did have access to a therapist in the same category that we think of as having a dentist or a pediatrician. It is expected that most people will have access to a dentist and most people growing up will have a pediatrician. It's sort of the norm. It's, it doesn't mean everybody does have it, but it's the default assumption. And there's good reasons for that and we should continue that. I would like to add a therapist as a third category of medical mental health provider that I hope over time gets lumped in there with the same level of assumption. And as I write on the slide, if we have a right to a lawyer, a right to a lawyer when we need one, my thinking is the same should go for teeth, body, and mind. And so if you have access to a therapist, great. You know, how often you see them can be once a month, once a season, once in the fall, once in the winter, once in the spring. It can be once at the beginning of school, once in the middle, at, after winter break, once at the end. If you're, if you're older, it could be once a year, just as your you know, general checkup. But I think we would all be better off if that were the case. And for the reason, and why do I think that? I will explain over the course of this lecture why I think that should be the case. On top of having a therapist, uh, I have my own live-in therapist, big, big proponent of pets and uh, mental health benefits of having a pet. This is my live-in therapist, our family's live-in therapist, Amber. And it is kind of fun and cute, but I can tell you, uh, although it's impossible for me to quantify the mental health benefit that uh, she provides this dog, it is significant and I know it and I see it uh, in myself and my wife and my kids. So, and I know that going, getting through grad school, I was aided very significantly uh, by volunteering at a local SPCA. Um, interesting, just to show you how big mental disorders and mental illnesses are. Until recently when this drug became generic and then its, its financial sales fell off. Up until that point, um, the number one selling pharmaceutical in the world in terms of total sales is a drug that many people have never heard of. It's called Abilify. It's technically categorized as an antipsychotic uh, pharmaceutical medication. And if you ask people what Abilify is, most people don't know it. And if you told them it's the number one selling drug for many years, that would surprise them. And then they'd say, are there really that many people diagnosed with psychosis? And the answer is no. But Abilify is used as an accelerant or uh, a turbo boost to many antidepressants. So many people who are taking an antidepressant 
and are not seeing significant or any results are often um, uh, prescribed Abilify along with their Lexapro, with their Zoloft, with their Prozac to try to get a better effect out of that drug, which just shows you that depression is actually extremely widespread in common. It's the number one most prevalent psychiatric diagnosis. Anxiety is closing that gap. But it's so big that a drug that is technically an antipsychotic, just because it's coupled with many antidepressants for many, many years was the number one selling drug. And there it is, right up there, number one. Nexium, Crestor, um, Humira for uh, anti-inflammatories, Remicade, another anti-inflammatory. Those were all up there, but Abilify for many years, number one. That tells you how many people um, are diagnosed, if they're not diagnosed, how many people are struggling with mental illness. It's the number one cause of disability in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, and it's harder to get the same kind of data on the causes of disability in other places, but it's safe to assume that mental illnesses are the number one cause of disability. I think you can say also very safely that it's the number one cause of student disability on college campuses as measured by students who are not able to attend class, not able to complete assignments, not able to fulfill their student responsibilities. And every person in life has a different set of responsibilities. As a professor, I do research, I give lectures, um, great papers, all the things that make a professor a professor. If I can't do that because of depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia, if I can't do that, then I'm disabled. And the biggest cause of disability uh, in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, and I would say many other places, is mental illness. Number two, alcohol and drug use disorders. In many instances, this is a form of self-medication for underlying untreated mental illness. So the top two in many ways are, are something to do with a mental disorder, mental illness. Another study to show how, how big mental illness is. In the United States, Britain, Australia, and Indonesia, they measured what caused the most misery. Being uneducated causes misery. Physical illness causes misery. Being alone, no partner, isolated, lonely, causes misery. So does poverty and, and definitely being unemployed. But the number one cause of misery is mental illness. The number one cause of uh, loss of economic output um, is not cardiovascular disease, although that's way up there and most people would pretty accurately guess that heart disease, cardiovascular disease is really big, but just a slightly bigger is mental illness. So it's, it's disability and it's also economic loss. Mental illness accounts for the biggest portion of that. 25% of American adults every year suffer from a diagnosable mental illness. A lifetime prevalence rate of a, a significant mental disorder or mental illness is about one in three. So if it, isn't, if it doesn't happen to you or me, it'll happen to someone that we love. It's a one in three chance. Also, we've, caught, we've talked a lot in this class about health disparities, disparities associated with race, with socioeconomic class, with can be gender. The biggest health disparity in all of healthcare are those Americans with a serious mental illness and those without. And those with a serious mental illness tend to die 15 to 30 years earlier than those without a serious mental illness. Biggest mental, uh, the biggest health disparity in healthcare. Another interesting graph to, to show global antidepressant use per 1,000 people. So per capita use of antidepressants. Look at this graph initially and think, oh my gosh, really high rates of depression in the United States and Iceland, something awesome going on in Korea and Chile, not much depression, not necessarily. There's actually a, a lot of depression in Korea and a lot of depression in Chile as well. This is actually can be an indirect way of measuring access to antidepressants and cultural acceptance of seeking treatment and help for depression. Some places, it's not as culturally acceptable to acknowledge depression and seek treatment for it. Other places, the United States, Iceland, Australia, Canada, more acceptable, hence you have higher rates. So when you see graphs like this, or if you see the number of students going to CAPS is increasing, you might think, oh my gosh, there's an increasing rate of mental distress. Maybe, but what's also happening, which could be a good thing is, less stigma, more access, more people who have been untreated and undiagnosed and not receiving access to treatment are now getting it. So being at the top of this graph of the most antidepressant use is not necessarily by itself a bad thing. This is one of the most important points uh, in this lecture that I really wanna drive home. 
and that is that in the field of mental health, diagnoses and the art of diagnostic making, making diagnoses is years behind other areas of medicine. And it's not because we're not trying hard. It's because to date, we do not have definitive blood, urine, or radiological tests to say Rick Mays is technically clinically depressed. There isn't a urine sample that I can give and a test that can be run that say, yep, he has depression and his wife, Jennifer, doesn't because she has the same test and it doesn't show up. This is one of the things that really makes the field of mental health so difficult is that you can have different people um, assessing a patient who looks like they're depressed and there's no independent test to say yes or no that if 10 people took a urinalysis test or if 10 clinicians took a urinalysis test of one patient, you'd get the same urinalysis test every time. You just don't have that in mental health. You don't have these independent uh, reliable, valid indicators of a, of a mental illness or mental disorder. Hence, all psychiatric diagnoses use different decision-making rules. And there's a huge amount of overlap in symptoms between different mental diagnoses. Moreover, almost all diagnoses mask the role of trauma and adverse events. They don't capture that. When they're screening for depression or anxiety, there's nothing in there that actually can really um, quantify trauma in someone's life and the, and the level of it that would be contributing to the mental distress. There's no capture of that in the diagnosis. And the diagnoses tell us little about the individual patient and what treatment is particularly good for them. So two people can have a fairly legitimate, valid diagnosis of depression, but what led to that and hence what would be the best treatment for them could be very different. One could be a combination of therapy and pharmaceuticals. One could be for different reasons, just pharmaceuticals, or one could be just therapy and all the different kinds of therapy and all the different kinds of pharma pharmaceuticals, and all the different kinds of combinations. There really isn't a standard one size fits all for one diagnosis, which is different for say tuberculosis. There's one bacteria that causes that, there is one set of antibiotics that treats it, and it's the same everywhere. So, all that to say, in the field of mental health, there is, as the slide before shows, there's an irreducible element of subjectivity in all psychiatric diagnoses. And here's a classic example is ADHD. They've done multiple studies, and I will go through this quickly, that show that if you live in a place where there's a cutoff for the grade school enrollment versus places that don't have an age cutoff, places that have an age cutoff create classes where there, is, there are older kids, older first graders, and younger first graders. And the difference can be 11 months between the oldest first graders in the class or in a school and the youngest first graders. It can be an 11 month difference with an age cutoff. And 11 months difference in elementary school is developmentally a significant difference. Thus, when you're making these diagnoses, what is, what is a clinical cut point for inattentive or hyperactive is relative to the student's peers in first grade, in second grade, in third grade. So if every grade you're the youngest or you're in the cohort of the youngest kids in each grade, well, you're by definition going to look and appear less mature, less self-controlled, maybe more hyperactive, maybe more inattentive. And it's not because you have an underlying disorder like ADHD. It just means that you're younger and less developed than your classmates. And also on top of that, most ADHD diagnoses begin with a suggestion by a teacher and Clinicians solicit survey data from teachers in making their diagnoses if they make them carefully. And hence, the teacher is filling out a questionnaire about Rick Mays. Is he, is he inattentive? Is he hyperactive? Well, it's relative to the other students in my class that the teacher has. That is subjectivity. And you can see right here, August, September, big jump uh, in states, the, the difference rates of ADHD diagnoses per 10,000 children. You see the big difference at the age cutoff point. And that means you're capturing that 11 month difference in kids in every grade and kids who are younger, just by, just by being younger, have a higher likelihood of being diagnosed with ADHD. That is another illustration of the subjectivity of many mental, dis all mental disorders and diagnoses all have a level of irreducible and unavoidable subjectivity. Another one, a common one, here's the depression Hamilton rating scale for diagnosing depression. It's a 17 uh, question survey. Look at these questions and I highlight a few of them. A big one, when people are suffering from depression, they often feel inordinate amounts of guilt. 
And then you're asking the patient on a scale, how much guilt are they feeling? Well, because you can't take a urinalysis test and you can't take a blood test, you have to ask the patient to give you that valuable urine data to fill this out to try to capture on this scale. You're basically half asking the patient to self-diagnose, half. I mean, it, it, and you're asking them in an impaired state to have the level of self-awareness to answer accurately and truthfully. That's hard. When you're suffering from depression or anxiety, the, the first thing that goes is self-awareness and accuracy and perspective. So this is another difficulty. It's not that there isn't a real set of symptoms with depression. It's that you're asking the patient to basically give that to you in an accurate way when they are the most mentally compromised. Another example, depressed patients can gain a lot of weight. They can lose a lot of weight. They can sleep too little. And part of that is because they have racing thoughts in their mind, so they're not getting enough sleep. Depressed patients can sleep too much. And those can both be indicators of depression and their direct opposites. Look at question number 16, loss of weight, rate, or, rate either A or B, or according to the patient or according to weekly measurements. You're actually asking the patient about their own weight loss, right? All of this to say, we aren't machines with broken parts. This is a famous book about uh, depression and anxiety. You aren't a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs. And let me take a moment to point out in this lecture on mental illness, uh, nurses and doctors both, and I wish I had had a, um, a reading or a video on the syllabus about nurses, and I've now since added that because nurses suffer from moral anguish and uh, empathy fatigue and burnout and depression just as much as doctors do, if not slightly more. It's an occupational hazard of being a nurse or a doctor and a doctor is you're at higher risk of depression. And I'm gonna take a moment to show you this, and it's not in its entirety, but I wanna show you the bulk of this. This is one of my famous, my favorite um, nurses that I follow on YouTube. Lots of valuable information. I would encourage you to follow her as well um, on YouTube. Let me show her explanation of how she treats patients and then how she, she experienced being a patient herself. Absolutely insightful. This is more of a long-term management solution, not I need help right this minute solution. Like I said earlier, I'm going to leave some links down below if you do need help this minute. But as an overall long-term adjunct to treatment, this is a really great option. And like I said, I've used it with so many patients because of the flexibility. I personally, when I'm talking to my counselor, I'm talking to her at 8 p.m., which most therapist offices aren't open at 8 p.m. It's usually on like a Friday night. And that's something that's been very helpful for my patients as well. Because the biggest concern I usually hear with patients who I'm saying like, hey, I think this would really be helpful for you, is that they don't have time. You know, their time is on the weekends or these odd hours that don't really fit with traditional schedules. This is easy. You can do it from your house, from wherever you are on your phone. I have a link down in my description box if this is something you'd be interested in checking out or even just referring if you're a provider, your patients to, or if you're a nurse, telling your patients about it. So they have an option because sometimes the whole hurdle of just even getting to the therapist's office is such a big hurdle and this eliminates that. So I've really enjoyed using them myself and with my patients and maybe you will too. All right, so now we kind of have an idea of how we're gonna treat it. Let's talk about really quickly some things that you want to assess for and that your patients might tell you that might send off a lightning bulb of like, oh, this might be what anxiety or depression looks like. So depression, real quick in a nutshell, and this is going to be very different for everyone, but this is Typical, I would say the most, we'll go over just the most common presenting symptoms. Unexplained exhaustion. And obviously, when you're dealing with patients, work up the other things that could be causing all of these things, but just keep in the back of your mind, like, this could be the cause. Feeling sad, crying all the time, wanting to just lay in bed, not finding joy in the things you usually find joy in, being incredibly unmotivated or distracted, being very, very irritable, having such a short temper, not being able to hold your cool like you normally would, either a loss or a huge increase in your appetite, sexual dysfunction. And one of the biggest ones I usually hear is that your partner or someone who loves you is telling you that something is really, really off. Now, in terms of anxiety, a lot of the same thing, heart palpitations, chest pain, racing thoughts, difficulty falling asleep at night because your mind's just racing and going over everything, Fidget, like uncontrolled fidgetiness, inability to just sit down and relax, 
GI complaints. Guys, GI complaints are huge with anxiety. Your patients will tell you that they're having diarrhea, they're constipated, their stomach constantly hurts. Look into this because your gut is one of the first places that starts screaming when your mind is not happy. Again, irritability, difficulty concentrating on tasks, and just that general feeling of like, I am so anxious, intrusive thoughts that are coming in all the time. That's kind of anxiety in a little bit of a nutshell. So there's my kind of basic things of what I look for, what you're assessing for, what you can ask, or if your patients start to say these things, it'll give you a clue. So now we know kind of how to screen, what to do if it's positive, and some symptoms you should be looking for. Now we'll talk about really quick just my experience with it because I think the more we talk about it, the more we share how we've all experienced it, the well, more we'll realize that, that this is normal, this is something we're all dealing with, it's not just you, and I think that's hugely beneficial. And as always, when we're having these conversations, if you dealt with something like this or you want to share, you just need to feel like you're not alone. Go read through the comments and hopefully people will leave them down there just sharing their own experience with it because I think that's just so, so helpful. I feel like we're not in this alone because it is a very isolating thing that I never really realized until I started to go through it. So I was very, very fortunate that for the really most of my life, I never dealt with anything mental health related. Personally, people I loved did, but nothing I could really relate to, but that came to an abrupt halt after I had Avery. Uh, my six week postpartum visit, I was diagnosed with postpartum depression, which was very spot on because I really, really did not do well on that PHQ-9 we talked about earlier. I was very, and I had a lot of the classic symptoms of depression. I felt very guilty about everything. <laughs> she couldn't figure out how to eat. She was very colicky. She wouldn't nurse. She just was angry and she seemed uncomfortable all the time. And I had immense guilt that like, why, like I brought this human into the world and she's just miserable and just all of the surrounding guilt around that, that I wasn't a good mother and this was my fault and this was why all of this was happening, that now I was a terrible wife on top of being a terrible mom. I was not happy. I did not enjoy anything. Like nothing that usually made me happy did. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to be crying or laying in my bed. I was incredibly irritable. Pretty much the entire list we talked about earlier, if you go down the list, it was what I was experiencing. And I will tell you, going into that appointment, I, until really I answered the questionnaire, I didn't know if I would answer it honestly, because going into it, I had a pretty good idea. Like, I don't think this is normal, but then at the same time, I was like, well, maybe it is. Like, I'm not sleeping a ton. I think this is just all related to that. There was a huge amount of denial, and I was a fairly, I was in my last year of NP school, and I had been a nurse for years. So I was a very, a pediatric nurse who dealt with postpartum depression, barely being parents a lot. So this was something I was very familiar with, but even then I had denial in myself. And that's given me a lot of insight into now working with patients because I know that a lot of people might have some denial around it, even if they're very educated on it, because you always think it won't happen to me. But I got into the office and I don't know, she asked me before I even filled out the questionnaire, she just asked me like a very simple, like, how are you feeling? And some kind of damn from inside of me, like, lifted up and I was like all my emotions vomited out and I was sobbing and that poor midwife she handled this so well but like to this day I'm like oh my gosh but I'm very glad I did um because I was then able to get some help that I very much obviously needed in that time to feel better and normal again even if I didn't necessarily want it right away which I definitely didn't I remember her saying you know I think we should start Zoloft and I think you need to go see a therapist and both of those I was like I don't need therapy and I definitely don't need medicine and she told me something that I tell my patients a lot if they are in the healthcare profession now is if you were your own patient and you were coming to me because I was just so embarrassed I was like I don't need medicine like which is so ironic because like I said, like that's what I did all the time was I had patients starting on antidepressants who then saw improvement because it is a chemical imbalance and that's what you need. But I, I was embarrassed. So if you ever gone through something like that, like you are so not alone, it's very different when it's you. Anyway, but like I said, what she did to kind of walk me through that was she was like, if the, you were your own patient, look at that objectively and what would you do? And I was like, oh, like, I would definitely probably tell them to go to therapy and start, like, all the evidence has shown us that therapy and, you know, starting some Zoloft will probably make this thing really be helpful. So I took it home. I waited, like, three or four days because I just could not wrap my mind around needing to start this. Then I started it. Lo and behold, six weeks later, like, I was starting to feel a little bit better in conjunction with I was going to therapy, but I only really went twice because then, like I said, school, newborn, 
there's just no time, which I definitely wish, like I said, I had thought of something like more online based because I think I would have kept going because it was very helpful to go and talk to someone about all these feelings I was having because it's not necessarily something you wanted to, I wanted to talk about with Joe was like, I feel like I'm the worst mother and I'm our child's like all of our, like I'm causing all of her problems. Um, because a lot of times the people that love us that we're ranting to about this just say like, of course not. Like, and you need someone to just kind of let all the feelings out rather than not be like, no, it's fine. But that was kind of my experience with it. I ended up taking Zoloft for eight months. And if you guys don't know, I'm pregnant again. I have not had any of the symptoms of any anything like that pre, you know, pre baby. And then afterwards, hopefully this time I'll be able to wrap my head around it a little bit more if it happens again and know that this is very treatable. It will get better. It'll be okay. Cause that was also something I did not feel was that it would ever be okay or get better. That overwhelming doom was huge. So again, if that's something you've ever struggled with, anything like that, please reach out to your healthcare provider because it was miserable and awful, but I am glad in hindsight that I kind of went through that because it has completely changed how I approach it with my patients and I have a whole new empathy level with it now that I've gone through something like that, which can kind of lead us into our next point of how I approach it with my patients and some tips there. So the biggest thing that I think I learned from going through something like this is to stress the importance of letting them know it's not their fault. It is not their fault that they are feeling like this. This is a chemical imbalance. Just like if you had hypothyroidism, would you feel bad about taking Synthroid? No, this is the same thing. You need a little bit more serotonin or something going on. This is not your fault. But because of the whole stigma around it, patients need so much encouragement in this way. And I have a whole new appreciation for patients who really don't want to start medicine because that had been me very much not too long ago, even with my whole background. So I'm just like patients who don't have that background, they really don't want to and they don't have that objective. Like what would you do if I was your patient? view of it. So I try to be really patient with that. So one thing I do try to do is if through my relationship with them, I have been talking and these little bells are going off, like maybe this is anxiety or depression playing into some of this. I'll start to bring it up early and just say like, Hey, just so you know, I think like these are some of the common symptoms, signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety. I'm noticing some of them in what you're telling me and I'll tell them what they've said that kind of strikes those little bells in my head. And we can start, at least start that conversation. And we can say like, this is what we do to treat this therapy. And we can do some medication. And if they immediately bulk, I just say, just think about it. You know, go home and look at some of your, like, just reflect. See if you're seeing these behaviors in yourself or all of this going on. And a lot of the times they'll come back in a month or two and they're like, you know, you're right. Like I have been seeing this and I think it would be helpful. And if not, that's totally fine. That's their choice. But I like to sometimes plant that seed initially if it's not, you know, like very blatantly obvious that this might be what's going on and it allows them to reflect and then we can come back and kind of make that decision together. The second thing I like to do, so I talked about doing screening at my annual visits. Now we do usually do the PHQ-2, I just usually do it verbally, but what I also accompany with it is I ask them how their mood is, which I have found to be better than like are you happy or something like, are you depressed? But something like that. Because usually when you ask someone about their mood, they're more likely to open up to you about all sorts of things. They'll start to say like, well, I think it's fine, but my wife says I'm the most irritable person in the world. And then you can kind of go down that and be like, mm, tell me more about that. Or they'll just tell you like, Meh, you know, the, the asking them how their mood is opens up. I've had much better luck with that conversation than just asking them straight like, do you think you're depressed? Any symptoms of depression? Because a lot of patients don't know, like I said, they think depression is just sadness and anxiety is sitting there having a panic attack and it is so much more than that. Third thing I really like to do with my patients when I'm having these conversations is have them in a chair kind of close to me, not up on the table. The exam table is very isolating. I, honestly, I do most of my talking with my patients in a chair because I feel like they talk better, but these conversations really should be had with them sitting in the chair where they are comfortable, where you are eye to eye, not having some like you're up here, they're up here, something like that. The fourth thing that I think is huge is not beating around the bush. I think if you act embarrassed to say the words anxiety, depression, bipolar, they're going to be embarrassed of it. We are creating, our, our culture as a whole already has so many negative connotations around these diagnoses. 
And it's almost like we're afraid to say it. Um, like I have been in a room with people who will not say like, oh, your history of your past medical history of, they're like, oh, and it looks like you had some trouble after your baby was born. It was postpartum depression. It's okay to call it that. Let's address it. Let's not like you had some trouble after your baby was born. <laughs> like that's just shaming it. So I think being very honest about it, like how is your anxiety doing? Asking your patients, how are you feeling with your depression? Ask the questions. I promise you that it feels a little bit awkward maybe, but that's going to just let them know that it's okay that that exists. Why does it feel awkward for us? I don't know, but I have had so much better. I've had such a better response when I just asked patients point blank, you know, like, do you feel like your bipolar is being managed? Okay. It tells them it's okay to have that. It is okay to have this going on. And I am here to work with you on it. You do not need to be ashamed of it. Oh, there's my soapbox there. I could go on forever on that one, but address it, call it by its name. Do not add further to the shame. That's already, they already probably may feel surrounding this. And the last thing before we wrap up is just to know your limits. Know when this is outside of your scope. Always, 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 I give patients, anyone who I think is struggling with anything in the mental health spectrum, the suicide hotline number. I make sure they go home with it. I try to give them any other resources for emergency lines like we had talked about earlier just because you never ever know. And going along with that, the two questions I really try to ask at most of these appointments, are you having thoughts of harming yourself or others? And do you find enjoyment? Are you able to enjoy things? Those are huge. That'll give you a really good idea of where they are. And you will be, I am very often amazed at how many people are having thoughts of wanting to harm themselves. And they, and I would have never known if I didn't ask, because sometimes I think we feel weird about asking. Like if I ask, then maybe the, it'll put the idea in their head. No, I promise you. Someone is, who is having those thoughts, this is not the first, like you are not inspiring it in them. It's better to ask, that way you can help them in the way that they need help. And really it's not weird, but it's harder for you to ask because you don't want to like step on their toes, but they usually don't mind answering. That's not something I've ever had someone be like, oh, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. I have felt, I don't anymore, but initially I felt very uncomfortable asking that because like I said, I just felt like I was instilling them with the idea. But now I've learned, like, this is a good question to ask, and you should ask it when appropriate. I would so much rather ask it and have them be like, no, than not ask it and have something horrible happen. All right, guys, I think that is pretty much my very not brief <laughs> approach to mental health and my experience with it in a nutshell. Like I said, thanks again to BetterHealth for sponsoring this video. I honestly, I use them all the time with my patients, and it might be a great option for your patients or even you if you just need somebody to talk to and think that therapy would be a great solution. I'll leave that link to their platform in the description box below, so make sure to go check it out, as well as all those other links about crisis hotlines and things that might be more helpful if you or someone you know needs some help a little bit quicker. Hope this video was helpful for you guys. Again, if you feel comfortable or you want to, leave your own experiences with mental health down below. That way we can all realize this really isn't something that just you or your loved one is dealing with. This is something that so many of us have dealt with. And I think the more we talk about it, the less it becomes this whole taboo thing. If these videos are helpful for you, I have a few more. They're called break room chats where we just talk about the more challenging things that we don't talk about very often especially on social media. And I'll leave those at the end of the video. Also consider subscribing if you want to see more content like this. I have nursing and NP content videos on Tuesdays and a weekly blog where I document my life inside and out of work as an FNP on Saturdays. Instagram is also a great place to get a hold of me or see what I'm doing throughout the day at work, what I'm learning. All of that good stuff happens over there. Hope you guys have a fabulous rest of your week and I will see you again next time. Bye. News. I highly recommend that channel. You learn a lot. I learned a lot. A lot to unpack in that that little segment that we watched. Um, here's where it gets interesting with psychiatric disorders. This is the technical definition. Psychiatric disorders are internal dysfunctions. Translation: We can't objectively confirm with a, a medical test, blood test, urine test, radiology, radiological test. We can't determine that you have that. Their internal dysfunctions that, on top of all that, a particular culture defines as inappropriate and that severely interfere with individuals' daily living. Another little wrinkle about uh, psychiatric diagnoses, they have a, a cultural component to them. Contrast that with COVID-19, tuberculosis, HIV, pneumonia, cataract, sepsis, diabetes, cancer, you name it, the vast majority of diagnoses, same cause, same symptoms, same treatment, 
everywhere on the board. When you get to the mental health area of healthcare, you can get things like this. Hikamori, um, unique psychiatric diagnosis, only in Japan, maybe a few cases in South Korea. If you look at the picture, it looks like a little bit of depression, some obsessive compulsive hoarding, maybe some crippling anxiety. In Japan, the term for it, the psychiatric diagnosis, is hikikomori, and the cultural connotation is, although not desirable, this is a phenomenon in Japan where uh, teenagers, disproportionately males, go into their room for very long periods of time, sometimes years, and sometimes for decades, and it becomes their lifestyle. If that set of circumstances occurred in here in the United States, if you all didn't leave your dorm room for four or five days, the RA would check in, the dean would check in, your roommates would check in. They'd say, well, you haven't been going to class. You haven't been leaving the room. There would be a cultural intervention because that's not culturally acceptable to stay in your room for long periods of time and never leave. But in Japan, this mental distress manifests this way. And it's not, again, not desirable, but it's socially acceptable. And it's a, it's a, a, a diagnosis that has J Japanese psychiatrists who specialize in treating it. You can see how the culture impacts and, and shapes what in our country would look like depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive hoarding. Interesting, as I mentioned before in this lecture, depression has always been the mother load, the most common diagnosis, the biggest cause of mental suffering. In recent years, anxiety, especially among young adults and teenagers, is starting to close that gap very significantly and maybe at some point might surpass it. Now, I'm going to show you a series of graphs that are just anecdotal, and they might just be correlation, no causation, but it's interesting to note that the percent of teenagers, 12 to 17, with major depressive disorder uh, and severe impairment in the past year had held steady for years from 2006 up to about 2011. Interesting, there was always this differential of, ma of males having lower rates of depression than females. Who knows if there's actual uh, underlying difference in depression rates. It might be that males don't feel as comfortable acknowledging depression and seeking help for it, and hence there really isn't a threefold variation. We don't know that. Um, but what's interesting that you can tell is that in 2011, at least for females, teenage females, rates of depression dramatically increased. So something was going on at that period of time. Trends in suicide rates of teenagers went up at about the same time. Suicide rates of 20 to 24-year-olds jumped up during that period of time. And I'm just going to put this out there that some people are, are fairly persuaded that the rise of smartphones coupled with social media and access to things like Instagram have some contributing element to this role of mental distress among young adults. And in places like UPenn and many other places where it is not, it is not unusual to have a suicide or two every year. And so have smartphones destroyed a generation? Sometimes this is just boomer ranting. I'll put it this way. This is my one little public service announcement that other people have, have urged, and I think there's probably some wisdom in this. And I've heard it a lot from uh, fourth-year students and the seniors in college who have to really get serious in their, their fourth year and remove all distractions from their, their lives so that they can focus on getting a job, getting into graduate school, getting into a fellowship or internship. They are very, very laser focused and they have to strip out all distractions from their lives. What do they do? They take off all the social media apps on their phone. They don't delete all of their accounts. They're still on their computer, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, otherwise, all of those are still there. They just take them off their phone because your phone is always going off, it's always calling for your attention, it's always vibrating, it's dinging, the lights are going on and off. Those are all elements that have a lot of similarities to um, um, the the devices out in Las Vegas, the the lot uh, the I'm blanking on the name, the slot machines that they they have the same dynamics that are addictive. Is that they call for your attention? You find that over time you need to check your phone more and more. Occasionally you look down, you realize, oh my God, I've spent 20 minutes just going through feeds. It's a colossal waste. And that in the end, the totality of that is not beneficial for people's mental health. So I often encourage students in this lecture to take a three-week detox. Just take them off your phone, keep your accounts elsewhere, but take all the social media apps off your phone. Delete them for three weeks, 
see how you feel. The thing I always hear the most from students is their mood elevates a little bit. The thing that they most appreciate is all the extra time they have to get all their other work done and then they can have some relaxation time. Yeah, I don't think even I or any of us realize how much of our time kind of you know, slips away on just sort of scrolling through the phone. And is our use of uh, social media increasing? Yes, and by the way, that these are all pre the lockdowns and quarantines that we're experiencing under this pandemic. So I can assure you all of these rates are skyrocketing right now. And different studies find over and over again that you know, really high rates of uh, screen time and social media use are correlated with increased rates of anxiety and depression. And a good article I'd recommend about, you know, the, the role of um, these social media apps causing more anxiety and distress, especially among teenage girls. And this is a study that came out this past year that showed that adolescents who spend more than three hours per day on social media are at heightened risk of mental health problems, particularly internalizing problems. So if you're hitting three hours above and you, your phone's telling you tracking this, consider putting some distance and detoxing. And it's interesting to know that the people that develop these apps and this, the, the technology often have clauses in their nanny contracts that prohibit the nannies from giving these devices to their children because they know more than all of us how addictive these devices are. I'm going to go through this section pretty quickly because it's important to know, but we have a lot of material to cover. But just for the interesting history of psychiatry and mental health, it's interesting to note that there have been, in the, in the, the modern era, three dominant treatment eras. The 1930s to the 1970s, this was the most popular image of, of best practices, modern mainstream psychiatric medicine of a clinician in a chair, a patient in some position, explaining uh, traumas of their youth, um, of their things in their life that the psychiatrist plums through to look for different forms of trauma and repress sexual desires, other psychological trauma, and it's much more therapeutic and not using medications. In the early 1970s, you have a rise of a new era called the bio biological psychiatry made possible by the 1960s discoveries of all these psychiatric medications that had not existed before. And then around the time that Prozac comes out is the, this, and this, this era is still going on, but it's now overlapped or parallel with cosmetic psychopharmacology where there are growing bioeth bioethical concerns about using psychiatric medications for just personal enhancement, just better academic performance or better work performance or just feeling better, even for patients who don't actually have a clinical diagnosis. I'm not gonna do justice to the whole Freudian paradigm and the whole school of psychoanalysis that Freud developed. Um, but suffice it to say that from the 1930s to the 1970s, if you went to a psychiatrist, odds are you went to someone whose thinking was Freudian and whose model was psychoanalysis and who wasn't very focused on your symptoms. They were only using symptoms to try to work their way back to what they believed was the cause, the underlying origin cause of your mental distress. And for the Freudians, they tended to focus on childhood and trauma in childhood and repressed sexual desires as a, if not the main driver of human personality. And, you know, for some people that might have been semi insightful or at, at you know, at worst, it might have been benign like they just didn't have any impact but there were instances where this model came up just made things up uh, like hysteria as a diagnosis for predominantly girls and women that had no basis in science and were actually quite harmful to people another example is maybe the most notorious example is autism so under the freudian model of mental distress a child presenting with autism has some form of trauma and it's not just a different cognitive development, it's trauma. And the trauma under the Freudian model is bad parenting and specifically bad mothering, cold mothering, non-emotional, non-loving moms causing the autism in their children the, and the autism being a withdrawal from normal society, normal, normal sharing of emotions and love. And so when women would come with their children, moms would present with their uh, children who have autism, very quickly, the conversation would be focused on the mother and the, prop, the psychological problems of the mom, the bad mothering, 
And the, the treatment under this Freudian model would start with trying to treat the mom, which was a double insult and a double pain on top of the trauma of trying to help children with autism. Click on this if you, if you have the time. It's uh, over the years, one of my students' favorite stories of how parents find ways to connect with their children who have autism. And it's, again, I highly recommend it. It's an article that's turned into a book and into a documentary about how this one family, Ron Suskin and his wife, uh, found the portal for their child who had autism. And their, the child's portal was Disney. And the child had memorized all the Disney lines. You might be wondering at this point, why would you sit on a couch and talk about what childhood, this or that, if you have a serious mental illness? Part of the reason why people opted for the couch was that until the drugs came out in the 1960s, pretty much the only three medical options you had was deep insulin coma therapy. You would overdose a patient with a mental illness with insulin and put them into a coma and then bring them out like a control alt delete of their brain, very intense and not, not medically used anymore. Um, a second option was electroconvulsive therapy, which in interestingly is still used today as, as a last resort for patients suffering from suicidal ideation, extreme depression. Interestingly, ECT generally works on about 70 to 80 percent of the population for whom no other mainstream pharmaceuticals for depression have worked, but we don't know why it works and we don't know how it works. And in back in the in many decades ago it was a pretty barbaric process so if you saw it you would might you might stay away from it and then the last option you had was a lobotomy which um we definitely don't do anymore and it was basically just an extraction of the prefrontal cortex of your brain very extreme surgery that um, rendered you pretty disabled so if you looked at those three options yeah it's not surprising that you opted for the couch and then the drugs came out, as I mentioned in the last class on pharmaceuticals, and gave clinicians a whole new set of treatment options to treat patients between the three medical extreme options and the couch. And this was a huge breakthrough. Now, you know, there was still a carryover of the Freudian uh, model. And you know, under the Freudian model, a lot of people were hospitalized for things that we do not consider disorders or illnesses anymore. And if you want to see a film that characterizes some of the misdiagnoses and the misuses of psychiatry um, in the, in the, the pre-biological era, back in the Freudian era, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a classic uh, movie to show that. You know, it, it was not uncommon for people to be institutionalized in mental hospitals for the diagnosis of homosexuality. Until 1973, that was a mental disorder. Um, and then eventually that was done away with. And the big key for that was um, the DSM, the third edition that came out in 1980, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the, 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 the book of all mental diagnoses came out and they shifted away from Freudian causes of mental disorders to the symptoms of mental disorders. The DSM said, we don't really know exactly what is causing depression. We don't know for sure what's causing anxiety or autism or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. We don't know. But what we can focus on more are symptoms of those illnesses and diagnoses and trying to get those more standardized. And that's been the shift since 1980 when this, the third edition of the DSM came out. And, in, and all practitioners and, and mental health clinicians are trying to make diagnoses as accurately as possible. And under limited information, and again, no blood test, no urine test, no radiological test, having to use self-reported questionnaires, the goal is to avoid type one and type two errors. But one of these errors is work. Errors is definitely more risky and dangerous. A type one error is a person does not have a mental disorder, but is diagnosed with one. That's not good, but a type two error is worse. A person does have a mental disorder, maybe a very serious one like depression, but the, it's not diagnosed, it's missed, or it's just not caught. The consequences of a type two error and mental health are more severe and more risky. And again, the goal is to try to not make either one of these errors, but diagnoses in the field of mental health are just more prone to type one or type two errors because again, we don't have those independent confirmations and tests. A very famous example of misdiagnosis in mental health was done by David Rosenhan in the 1970s at Stanford. And he was a critic of the Freudian 
approach to making diagnoses. And he thought that the, the, the Freudians were just making up psychiatric diagnoses and they were not reliable and they were not consistent and they were not accurate, but he wanted to prove that. So if you ever want to read one of the most famous articles, read on being sane in insane places, where David Rosenhan sent his graduate students home for the summer and said, go to your local mental institution, knock on the door. All of you say the same thing. Say you're hearing voices, the voices say thud, and see what happens and see if you're diagnosed with something. And if you're diagnosed, see if you're hospitalized. And if you're hospitalized, see how long you're hospitalized. And if you read the report, what made it famous was all the students who did not have a serious mental illness were all diagnosed with one. And then they were all hospitalized for varying degrees of time, various amounts of time. And some of them got out very quickly, but then some of them, it took a long time for them to get out. His point was, under that old model, you are missing people who have it and you're diagnosing people who don't have serious mental disorders because you're focusing on these Freudian origins and causes that aren't scientific. His argument was you need to shift away from that. Now, speaking of shifts, um, it's interesting to note that the nation's largest inpatient mental health facility actually isn't a mental health facility. It's the Cook County Department of Corrections and prison system outside of Chicago. One of the tragedies that is associated with the drugs that came out in the 1960s is the process of what they call deinstitutionalization. So the thought was we have all these great drugs that treat people. You don't need to take people out of society and put them in mental hospitals never to return to, to their homes. Now you can deinstitutionalize, empty the institutions with the medications and let people receive treatment in local community mental health centers in their hometowns. Great idea, great concept, but those mental health facilities in towns were never built. And so what has replaced the old mental hospitals in the end are prisons, because now when people have serious mental illnesses that aren't treated, they end up in the emergency department and or they end up in prisons, or they commit their higher rates of suicide. As psychiatric beds per year have gone down, suicides have gone up. We'll return to that uh, at a later point about the need for new hospital facilities for people suffering from severe mental illness, which we don't have. This problem is often seen um, in society and also on college campuses, because if you talk to people who run CAPS at uh, UVA or elsewhere, they never have enough resources. Um, and places that are, you know, like Indiana University has a really high ratio of undergraduates to mental health providers. Private institutions tend to have better ratios, but even these ratios are still, that's a lot of students per individual mental health providers. And it's not uncommon a month into school to have waiting periods to see a therapist of two to three or more weeks, which is a dangerous situation. Cornell is also known as a place that has had to wrestle with this over the years and they send out Right, uh, tips like this to faculty. I get this a lot um, as a professor in the fall and spring semesters, recognizing assisting students in distress. So I'm very familiar with this. But if you're not and you're looking at these, a lot of these symptoms are, they can go either way. They can be the student uh, makes complete eye contact, almost uncomfortable eye contact with you uh, as a professor, or the, the, the student makes no eye contact with you and is looking away and is disheveled. And it can be really hard to try to read the symptoms and read them accurately. And, and, and because of that, trends in suicide death rates for young adults has also continued to increase. I encourage you to click on this and this interview with John Green, and he explains his own experiences with anxiety and OCD. Um, I learned a lot from it and I encourage you to watch it as well. There is a mental health crisis on campus. What is causing it? The answer is it's clearly multifactorial. There's lots of contributing factors. And as I said in an email um, earlier this semester, I think increased student debt loads has got to be a contributing factor. Um, smartphones is probably in some measure for some people a form of mental distress. Uh, just the, the pressure and anxiety of college, especially at competitive elite colleges. You come from a high school where you're in the top 10, 20% of your class and you're used to being a big fish and and able to meet all the challenges and you're a star performer and then you get to college and you're like, wow, everybody here is a big fish and everything feels competitive in a way that you're not prepared for. Unhealthy competition, constant pressure, constant pressure to perform, to get the next internship, to get the, the good grades, 
all of that can feed in along with the increasing debt loads to greater mental distress on college campus. This story really shook a lot of people, myself included. So Penn, UPenn's had a problem with college mental health among its student population. And it brought, it brought in one of the leading college mental health leaders, Gregory Ells, to, to, to bolster its caps. And last year he committed suicide, which I don't think you get a bigger red flag that there are some changes that need to be made to maybe just college itself, that you can keep adding staff and expanding caps and lowering therapist wait times and increasing appointments, and that's all good. Definitely do that. But concurrently, upstream, maybe we need to have some real strong thinking and some, some real changes about what college is and how it's structured and the way it's financed and the debt loads that we're dealing with. Because if those are causing mental distress on college campus, then you, you can build all the caps you want and you're just going to put band-aids on the problem. This is a, this, the suicide of this individual should be a huge wake up call. And this goes back to the problem in our society when it comes to mental health is that we have some psychiatric facilities, we have emergency departments, but we don't really have anything in between that and home or back in the dorm. And we need a different set of, of mental institutions, mental hospitals for long-term stabilization of patients. And we lost those when they closed the asylums and we need to bring them back. And you guys can click on this. I'm not gonna show it to you in this lecture, but this case is a very vivid illustration of the need for a third place between home and the hospital for patients to receive long-term mental care for stabilization. And we just don't have those right now. This is Senator Cree Deeds and his son Gus Deeds. Please watch this if you get a chance. Again, this is. I'm glad to see the Journal of the American Medical Association calling for the same thing, which is bring back the asylum, improve long-term psychiatric care. We need these facilities. There's another angle that makes managing student distress on college campus extra difficult, which is when you're dealing with college students, those are legal adults over the age of 18. And when students come to college, they all sign these FERPA forms, like do you give permission to the school, to your faculty member, to your faculty advisor, to the dean's office, do you give them permission to talk to your your family about you and your grades or anything. Some students legitimately say, yeah, you, you're welcome to, to contact and talk to my parents about me. But it's also very legitimate for a lot of students to say, no, I'm not comfortable um, with the school talking to people about me, talk to me, because I'm an adult now and I don't want my parents knowing about my course selection or my grades or what clubs I'm associated with. I am now in college and I wanna be treated as an adult and be autonomous and independent. So legitimate, fair, honest, I get it, but this is a set of parents and they're not the only ones who, after their child has committed suicide, come to the school, collect all their belongings, and then look at the email chain and look at the letters and say, we, the parents, are the last ones to know that our child was really struggling here at school and the dean's office knew it and the CAP's office knew it, the roommate knew it, but we didn't know it because the school was not legally allowed to share this information with the parents. It's, it's a really difficult situation. It's, it's even made more difficult by a, a ruling in the courts recently, I think this was at Stanford, this is an article about it, that said, if a student who is experiencing severe mental illness harms another student, a roommate or anyone else, the school is liable for the injury or the wrongful death of the student harmed because the court ruling concluded schools have a responsibility for the safety of their students. So what's the significance of this court ruling? The significance of this court ruling is universities and dean's offices are now legally obligated to try to make the safest environment they can for all of their students. So if you're a student presenting and acknowledging and seeking help for severe mental illness, it's logical for student for universities to encourage students who are experiencing that to go home and just take a medical leave from school, which can be financially difficult because if you do it anytime after two or three weeks in the semester, you can lose a lot of money, number one. Number two, it can be forced on students to go home. It can, it can be outside their decision because the school can force them to go home. And that can be really as disorienting for students to leave whatever social support resources and access to CAPS that they have at school. I'm empathetic to both sides. 
If I was a student, I would want to remain in control of my own destiny. If I'm a college dean, I want this, I want me to have my autonomy too, but I also am trying to balance that with what is the best thing for all the other students that I'm I am living with. Type one, type two errors. You're gonna see this throughout the, the mental health sector all the time. Another video I would show portions of in class about college student mental health. I encourage you to click on that if and when you have time. Um, watch this. Now, how can we, now here's, do you want some good news that's kind of creepy, it's a little bit big brother, but it could solve some of these problems. I'll let you all decide. There's a new app that colleges are adopting. Uh, Syracuse has this, I'm pretty sure VCU has it. I'm not sure if Virginia Tech has it, but Syracuse does, it's called Spotter EDU. And essentially every student comes in and gives permission for the school to track their, their, their uh, smartphones. They use it initially for attendance policies. Every time you go into the lecture hall, you are shown on the phone that you've, you're attending Professor Mays' GNUR 5390 class, and you get credit. So it's good for big classes of hundreds of students. Well, this software can monitor the phone's usage and whereabouts and even how much you're sleeping, how much food you're getting, how many classes you're attending, how often do you go to the gym, where are you at any given time? And it's used for attendance, but it's also increasingly used. So here's the professor who's like, great, I love it. Ever since they adopted this, student attendance has gone up as, as it should be. The other potential good use of this software and this application is when you're collecting that much data on thousands, if not tens of thousands of students every year, you can build profiles of students who end up taking medical withdrawals for any number of things. It can be uh, pneumonia, it can be depression, it can be anxiety, and you can begin to see the patterns. You can work backwards from all the students who've gotten a D or flunked a class, or all the students who've had to withdraw from school for depression or for some other or sorry, addiction. You can take all of those profiles, look at all the different data points, and start drawing predictive models of students who are on certain paths. And if you do this well enough, you can, in the future, you can intervene and say, hey, Rick, uh, Rick Mays, you've missed three classes, you've stopped going to the gym, blah, blah, your grades are doing this and these three classes. You will fit the profile of a student who is 94 times out of 100 about, well, at the end of the semester withdraw. We know that. And so we're going to intervene and get you a counselor. We're going to adjust your classes. We're going to move upstream and try to catch this and correct it. It's not surprising that um, one st stakeholder group that really likes this software are parents. Parents who are spending enormous amounts of money or are going into enormous amounts of debt to send their children to college next to their house, their biggest financial expenditure in their lifetime want schools to be monitoring this because they don't want to get a call in November or April and say, hey, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Mays, your son, Rick, sorry to tell you this, but uh, he has to withdraw. He flunked all of his classes. He is in, he's in um, bad health. And the parents being, well, now we're finding this out. Now we're being told. Is there any, was there any way you could have intervened? The, the first question is, when did you know this and, and how did you know this? Okay. Step back for a moment. There are many controversies in the field of mental health. Should you focus more on talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy? Should you focus on more, more on pharmaceuticals? Should you combine the two? A lot of those disagreements stem from the fact that there are essentially four categories of psychiatric diagnoses. The first one are psychiatric diagnoses for which the underlying problem is a physical disease. There's tissue damage in the brain. So schizophrenia, schizophrenia and Alzheimer's have psychological, psychiatric, mental symptoms, but what's underlying that, what's causing them are, is actual damage to the brain that you can see it when you do an autopsy of the brain. That's category number one. Category number two are people who are dealing with another category of, of psychiatric diagnoses, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder. If you were to look at their brains, and you can't, we don't have the technology, if you looked at the tissue, you wouldn't see any tissue damage. There's no damage to the brain. If they died and they had lifelong depression, you wouldn't necessarily see any difference in the brain. But they suffer uh, intermittently from these disorders and these illnesses over the course of their lifetime. So how do you treat them versus how do you treat psychiatric diagnoses that have um, underlying brain tissue damage? 
third category of um, psychiatric diagnoses are patients who have a, basically some form of addiction problems. They have a behavior um, that has become a, a disability. It can be alcoholism, it could be a drug addiction, it could be a sexual habit, a sexual addiction, food consumption. It's something that in moderation is fine and healthy, but then it gets out of control. And that's a, that's a how should you treat that group of people? Should you do medication? Should you do therapy? What's most effective? AA, disagreement about that. And maybe the most controversial category of psychiatric diagnosis is the fourth one, and that is emotional reactions. And I'll give you an example. I think if you ask most RAs, um, most of them are trained to view student homesickness in the first year as something that is both normal and the normal duration is about to, th you know, roughly speaking, Thanksgiving break, that the majority of first year students will feel some measure of homesickness until around Thanksgiving, and that's sort of the period in which it begins to, it begins to wear off. Well, so, don't intervene, don't medicate, don't send them to CAPS in October of their first year if they're suffering from homesickness because that's a normal emotion. And emotions by themselves are not bad, they're fine. The question then is, how, when does that emotion of homesickness become a problem? And if it's first semester sophomore year and they're still struggling in school because they feel homesick their second year, then you know, then the argument is, well, then do you seek therapy treatment? Then do you consider psychiatric medication? Because what's a normal emotion is now, quote, not normal. Well, you can see why that's going to cause a lot of controversy, because what's normal for one person isn't normal for somebody else. We all have different personalities. You know, some people are more extroverted and high energy, like Tigger, and, and some are more melancholy and withdrawn and introverted. And what's normal for homesickness for college student Eeyore is going to be very different Tigger probably doesn't even feel any homesickness when uh, Tigger goes to college. So trying to come up with parameters for what is normal and what is not worthy or warranting intervention for mental health, and then when it traipses into, well, okay, now we do need to kind of intervene, is subjective and arbitrary. Another area of mental health that's subjective and arbitrary, which brings us to one of the most controversial and debated areas of mental health, and that's cosmetic psychopharmacology, the use of medications that are previously for people with a diagnosis or disorder, uh, in this instance, are used by people that don't have a diagnosis, but they use an ADHD drug, for instance, or modafinil for um, cognitive and performance and memory enhancement. And I'm sure this is not a shock to anybody watching this video, but um, the illicit use of ADHD drugs on college campuses is significant. I'll just leave it at that such that at some schools they've added it to the honor code that the, the, unla the, the, the unlawful use of psychiatric medications like ADHD for the purposes of academic enhancement is a violation of the honor code. Now, you have a, in this cartoon, you have a, a young adult saying, I've taken my medication, have you taken your medication? There's always been a differential among adults, not among teenagers, uh, among women using psychiatric medications and men. There's always been about a 10-point gap I don't think it's closed too much in the last decade. There are different theories as to why that might be the case, but one of the ones that's most interesting is that you also find that men tend to be heavier smokers, um, heavier drinkers, and more likely to, to attempt suicide. And hence, what that differential back here might really be is just a 10-point difference in men acknowledging and seeking help, and they instead self-medicate with alcohol and nicotine and drugs. It's impossible to know, but it's a, it's, it's a plausible hypothesis. There's a, along those same lines, um, if you talk to mental health clinicians, they'll say, you know, anxiety, we think of it as one thing, but it, it can manifest differently in men than it does in women. Um, in men, it can often appear as anger, muscle aches, GI issues, a lot of GI issues, and alcohol use. Okay, so you might, at this point in the lecture, think, wow, Professor Mays is really pushing the pharmaceutical option I, I think it's great when the, I, I do believe in pharmaceuticals for people who need it. And I I'm, would never want to return to the era that we didn't have them. And they have saved millions and millions of lives and enhanced the quality. Um, are they sometimes overdiagnosed and not overused or overused? Yes. Um, sometimes they're, it's, 
that that's one of the type one, type two errors. Another issue with um, antidepressants in particular is that they are really, for, for many, many patients, once they get on them, benefit from them, and then try to wean themselves off of them, they, they are particularly hard to quit. And there are some serious symptoms and side effects of getting off antidepressants. And you have you know, upwards of 25 million adults that have been on antidepressants for two years or more. You have a lot of people who are trying at some point to kind of decrease the dosage because there are always side effects with these drugs. And they're finding that they're quite hard. And so if you ask doctors today, if they're giving you good medical advice, they're saying, yes, consider uh, quitting antidepressants, but in, in so doing, do it very, very slowly. Think in terms of months and years rather than days and weeks of weaning yourself off of these drugs. Is it okay that about a quarter of the populate, of adult population is on psychiatric medications? Well, this uh, psychiatrist, Julie Holland, thinks that no, that we've gotten to the point that we're over-diagnosing normal emotions. And if you saw the film Inside Out, uh, you realize that you know, emotions are evolutionarily um, evolved. We've, adopted, we've evolved them over many, many, many centuries because they help in our survival. I mean, feeling these, having robust feelings are often signals to get attention or to get help or they're cues, they're red flags to say, if you're continuing to feel profound sadness for prolonged periods of time, that's an indicator that you have an underlying issue that, that, that you need to have attended to. And if the argument goes that if you are really quick to medicate normal emotions, you're, you're basically taking away all these indicators of of things that are that are underlying the symptoms that you're now medicating. Okay, shifting away from that, um, I, I'm happy to report that I think the stigma of mental illness and mental distress is going down. And I'll give you some examples. This is a, a, an employee of a company who uh, tweeted her boss last year, and instead of coming up with some fake excuse for why she wasn't going to come in on work at work the next week for Monday or Tuesday. She didn't say she was sick or she had the flu. She said, you know, I'm taking today and tomorrow to focus on my mental health. Hopefully I'll be back next week refreshed and back to hundred percent. It's okay for us to say we are sick and we're taking a sick day from work, but it's not yet hundred percent. Okay. To say I'm taking, I'm not mentally hundred percent. So I'm going to take a mental health day. Mental health day is kind of a, almost kind of like a joke term. And I think it's valuable to say, brain is an organ. Your mental health is just, it's in, intertwined with your physical health and it deserves the same respect and reasons for well-being. Such that some schools are now saying, you know, we should, we should weave this into syllabi and into schools that, you know, build this in from an early age that it's, it's good and valuable and wise to take mental health days as students, as young adults, as workers, Mental health days are good. And, you know, who else really needs them? Doctors, nurses, nurses in particular um, have just as high, if not higher, burnout rates, compassion fatigue, moral injury, because they're seeing really difficult stuff every single day. They'll see nurses, like doctors, can see multiple patients that they become very attached to over a long period of time can die in a single week. I'll click through all of this. I'm just going to give you some, you know, Anthony Bourdain, Untreated Depression or Treated But Not Treated Effectively. Maybe the most famous book on depression. If you want to gain some insight into what depression is like, it's really hard if you haven't experienced it to truly understand depression is not just feeling down. It's not just a couple of, you know, slightly depressed mood or lack of energy. It's its own dynamic that this book does a very good job of explaining. And you can read about it. And I think, you know, this is another interesting exchange by a, a writer in Hollywood who experiences depression. One of his fans wrote, do you have advice for dealing with depression? And he said, he just wrote, tweeted back a series of really valuable responses. For one, admit and accept that it's happening. Awareness is everything. We put ourselves under so much pressure to feel good. It's okay to feel bad. It might be something you're good at. Communicate it. Do not keep it secret. Own it like a hat. Your feelings are real. Two, try to remind yourself over and over that feelings are real. Let me say this again. Feelings are real but they aren't reality. Example, you can feel like life means nothing. Life has no meaning. True feeling, important feeling, true that you feel it, but whether life has no meaning, that's not up to us. Facts and feelings, equal but different. And he just goes through another set of really important things to talk out when you're experiencing mental distress. If you want to know more about depression, and you think, why, am I, why is Professor Mays highlighting anxiety and depression? 
Those are the two biggest mental diagnoses overall and on college campuses by far the two biggest causes of distress and disability, anxiety and depression. So click on um, this uh, Level Up Nurse uh, YouTube clip on depression and diagnosing depression. Together with medications and therapy, better diets, and these, there are certain diets that can improve your mental health. If, you get to, if, if a patient gets to the point where all of those resources and treatments have not worked, I'm happy to tell you that in the last year, the, the newest drug approved by the FDA for treatment of severe depression, the first one in decades, is ketamine, which it, I think some of you may be familiar with, um, is sometimes used recreationally, in, and I, I, have, I think it's called Molly, I don't know. But um, that's not ideal that people are using it for that purpose, whatever, I'm not gonna weigh in on that. But ketamine has now been approved for people with severe depression, and it can be, it works. And it works for people for whom nothing else works. I share this with you because if you or someone that you love ever gets to the point where suicide or harming themselves or harming others is becoming something that you're concerned about, the good news is there's a new drug that's been approved. And on top of that, it can be injected nasally and work within two hours, which is a godsend because most antidepressants, if they work, take three to six weeks to kick in. And even ECT therapy as a last ditch resort, that often takes two to three weeks before it can work. So if you're in a real crisis situation, I am happy to report there is a new drug available. There's an old drug used in a different way, thankfully. And where is this drug needed? Well, interesting study to show that, you know, these are the places, it tends, mental distress is everywhere, but it's also acutely in rural areas. Rural areas are where some of like, the, these are the areas right here, some of these blue areas, Appalachia, no surprise. Um, it, right through here, um, this is some low income poverty areas, higher rates of suicides. Another interesting finding is that places that have more guns have higher rates of suicide, higher gun deaths. And that's because guns are one of the most common ways people impulsively commit suicide. So if there are more guns around, it's just easier in an impulsive moment to find one. And so, you know, places that have lower rates or lower numbers of guns per capita have lower suicide and death by, um, by gun rates. Another thing that can lower suicide rate is higher minimum wages. You know, it, it's intuitive to think that if you can help people more financially, you help their mental health. Yeah, that's good. And here's the data to show that that's the case. So are things getting better or worse? This is a really interesting slide to give during this pandemic. So I'll just, let you read this, but you know, Hans Rosling is a famous uh, public health researcher who said, historically things are, are as good as they've ever been, even with the bad things that we're dealing with like pandemics. So you have to hold both of these two things in your mind simultaneously, that in all of human history, the things now are as good as they've ever been economically, maternal mortality rates, cancer survival rates, life expectancy, all of that is as good as it's ever been. And yet we still have things like coronavirus and we still have maternal mortality rising in the United States. So you got to hold both of these things in your mind at the same time. Now, are things getting better or worse? It also partly depends on where you live. And I've always enjoyed showing these slides of per capita rates of teenage depression, higher rates here, lower rates in the white states, adult depressive per capita rates. So major depressive episodes in adults, higher out here. And then where's the suicide rate um, per, per 100,000 people the highest? Based on all of these things together, South Dakota, Hawaii, New Jersey, Iowa, Maryland, and Minnesota are the least depressed, happiest states. And then interestingly, the state that has some of the highest levels of mental distress, Utah. And it's even, even more interesting that Utah actually, while it's the highest rate, highest level of mental distress for states, is also the healthiest physiologically, lowest rates of obesity, lowest rates of heart disease, lowest rates of type two diabetes. It's a really interesting conundrum that Utah has some of the best physical health, but some of the most concerning mental health statistics. So what should we do there? What should we do everywhere? Interesting contributing um, possibility that people are talking more and more about is saying, hey, we add uh, fluoride to the water in very trace amounts to lower the rates of cavities. You know, there are parts of the country that have in the aquifers below where the water is, is, is run through has higher rates of natural occurring lithium and places that have 
more natural occurring lithium in the aquifers and hence in the water supply are also places that have lower rates of depression and suicide. So maybe we should think about mental health the same way we think about dental health. If we add a little fluoride to lower the rates of cavities and tooth decay and, and dental disease, maybe we could add trace amounts of lithium to our drinking water and lower the rates of depression and suicide. I think it's worth thinking about. What's, all, what's definitely worth thinking about, and what I think I showed this earlier in the semester, is spending more time in nature. And doctors are increasingly prescribing spending time outdoors for uh, treatment of all kinds of conditions and diagnoses, and, and definitely in mental health. So, you know, get off your screens, put your phone away, and just go spend time in nature. It has therapeutic potential. I often advise a lot of students on study abroad, and they come back and advise me on the places that they like the most. I am struck by how many students I have advised over the years that consistently rank Denmark and Scandi excuse me, Scandinavia as the places they enjoyed the most and didn't even want to, almost didn't want to come back to the United States. This is the program that I've heard the most about. So this is not a, I'm not paid by DIS or anything. I'm just telling you person to person, colleague to colleague, um, this is the most popular pre-health program and just in general, the program that so many students want to go on. And there are so many good ones, but there's something about Denmark and Scandinavia that lower rates of depression, happier people. Uh, I kind of want to close out this lecture talking about something that's gaining traction in the medical literature, and that's this issue of human flourishing. And what this says in a nutshell is that we kind of want to get beyond just the are you depressed or not depressed. Of course, we don't. We prefer not depressed over depressed. We prefer students not be crippled by anxiety. So you know, less anxiety, less depression. But beyond that, what do we really, really want? We want to be flourishing. We want to be enjoying life. We want to be happy, content. We want to be enjoying life. Not just not depressed, not just not anxious. We want life to be good. And it has all these different components to it. It has a, you know, for a lot of people, it's family is key. That's your social support network. Work. That's why unemployment is one of the biggest risk factors for mental distress. Education, being a part of a religious community, having good character and virtue. It's actually really important that you develop good. I mean, that sounds so, oh my God, I feel like I'm, I'm like a Sunday school teacher right now, but character and virtue are really important for mental health, close social relationships, having a sense of meaning and purpose, good physical and mental health, all of that contributes to more or less human flourishing. And if you want to get a back of the envelope measure of how much you are or are not flourishing, this is this came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. One, two, three, six, six factors or six features of flourishing. Each one of them has two questions on a scale of zero to 10. So this is the same set of questions or the same factors with a rating scale. So domain one, happiness and life satisfaction. Overall, how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? Zero, not satisfied. Ten, completely satisfied. Uh, under mental and physical health, how would you rate your physical health? You could have very poor health. That's going to be like a big contributing factor to your mental health. Or you could have really awesome, excellent physical health. How would you rate your overall mental health? Look, you can take your, your phone, don't take your phone, put your phone away. You can take your notepad, tally this up, zero to 10 on, all, six, on, on six of these features, 12 total questions. And each of them can be a maximum of 10 points and just add them up. I, this, one of the ones I think is really important is financial and material stability. How often do you worry about being able to meet normal monthly living expenses? Well, I'm telling you, if you worry all the time, that is going to directly impact your physical and especially your mental health. So guys, take a moment, go through each of these questions, get your score. And they're actually even, they're, there's not even a, a code that goes with it that says, this is how much you're more not flourishing. But here's a general rule of thumb I've come up with. If your final score is between 100 and 120, you're flourishing. If your final score is between 80 and 100, you're relatively flourishing. If your score is between 60 and 80, I would say that's not terribly flourishing. That's sort of treading water. And if your score is 60 or below, that is, that is a, that's a red flag that you should seek help. And I would encourage you to, to get that basic score and then behave according to that score. I'm going to close this lecture with 
I, I started the lecture with an exhortation of a therapist. Um, I then had a slide on my live, my at home, our family's uh, live in therapist, our dog. But the science also shows that two, the two most effective treatments for battling depression are exercise, ideally outdoors, and spending time with pets, also ideally outdoors. I'm going to close with another shameless plug for a documentary. I hope you all find the time to watch in the near future. And all of us seem to have more time for documentaries these days since we're spending a lot of time at home. I'll show you this and then I'll sign off. Picture the dog in your house, oh, good boy. wagging its tail, and licking your face, and how good that makes you feel. Oh my God, it's incredible. Yes, it is. I've set my life up to be a veterinarian that deals with terminal cases from all over the world. <laughs> We've got increased rates of cancer, diabetes, name it. We see the worst of the worst here. Most of the animals already had third, fourth, and fifth opinions. We are in their very last dose. I don't want to lose her. I was working in conventional veterinary medicine. I became a very sickly person. My doctor recommended antibiotics, long-acting steroids. That got me searching for answers conventional medicine didn't offer. This when we first brought up a holistic vet to me, I was like, so they can take grass and rub it all over my dog? I've been criticized. Snake oil sales, Charlotte. The holistic or alternatives say, I don't want to do anything conventional. Or the conventional vet who says, absolutely no alternatives. They're all coming in after being on drugs. They want to know how you make this dog better. Integrative medicine works. I'm here to destroy this guy. He just did the biggest miracle of my entire career. I actually fainted. Whether you're a person or an animal, it doesn't matter. Being in a hospital sucks. <laughs> you're okay. They don't understand what's happening to them. They're just trusting us. <laughs> Coming from a traditional background, I can't even conceive of this kind of success. With cryosurgery, we actually freeze it to our advisors trying to work with the immune system. <laughs> People say, do you think it's working? Yeah, he had five weeks to live two years ago. <laughs> If I gave up knowing that this can be done, <laughs> that would kill him. Oh boy, it's a whole new process of thinking. Okay, so I'm going to sign off. And given the, the time at night that I'm taping this, when I get home, my family will be asleep. So uh, our dog will be greeting me and increasing my dopamine and serotonin. And I'll be feeling better. And get a mental uplift from my pet, our pet. I'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye. You have stopped screen share.